Welcome to Pharma Drama, the channel where we look at the science of healthcare and healthcare products. In this video, we're going to carry on looking at amorphous materials with the aid of this diagram. You might have seen it before. It's the diagram I drew when I explained why amorphous materials don't melt. But amorphous materials do all sorts of other things, which are kind of tricky to understand. And one of those things is relaxation. So I thought it would be a tremendous idea to explain what relaxation is, what happens when an amorphous material relaxes, and where does relaxation fit in this diagram. So if you want to know, get yourself a cup of tea or coffee. You know which one I've got. It's a cup of coffee, isn't it? And let's make a start. A really good example of an amorphous material is candy floss, or if you're American, cotton candy. Candy floss is made of sucrose, and all the molecules in candy floss are randomly arranged. So candy floss is amorphous. Think about a sugar cube. A sugar cube is also made of sucrose molecules, but in that instance, the sucrose molecules are aligned in a perfectly repeating pattern, so the material is crystalline. So, a sugar cube is crystalline sucrose, candy floss is amorphous sucrose. Now think what happens when you put those materials into your mouth, not at the same time, because that would be a um, sugar overload, wouldn't it? Put the sugar cube in first, think what would happen. It's not going to dissolve instantly, is it? It's going to sit there for a bit, and you're probably going to move it around with your tongue, or try and drink some water, or crunch it a little bit to try and get the molecules to disperse before you swallow it. And the reason is because the molecules are held together in a crystalline lattice, and so they don't want to break apart. In fact, energy has to be put in to break those molecules apart to get them to dissolve before you can swallow the solution. Now think what happens when you put candy floss into your mouth. You put, take a big bit of candy floss, because it's very fluffy, isn't it? And you put it into your mouth, and it's almost instantly disappeared. When I ask students, What's happened to the candy floss? A lot of students say, well, it's melted, hasn't it? So it's melted in the mouth. No, if you've watched the previous video, you will know uh, amorphous materials don't melt. So the one thing that candy floss didn't do was melt. What it did do is it dispersed very quickly in the saliva in your mouth, um, and then you were able to swallow it very quickly. And in fact, it's this difference in dissolution rate between amorphous materials and crystalline materials, which is what leads to amorphous materials being so popular for poorly soluble drugs. If you've got a drug which in a crystalline form really doesn't want to dissolve, have a go at making it amorphous. It should dissolve faster and to a higher concentration. Now, you might say to me, well, that sounds excellent, doesn't it, Simon? You haven't chemically changed the drug but you have improved its solubility. Why aren't all poorly soluble drugs formulated in the amorphous form? And I would say, that's a very good question. And the answer is, the pharmaceutical industry is a very conservative industry. So the three things that matter are efficacy, toxicity, and stability. And I think you might see that I could leave a sugar cube on the side of a laboratory for a long time and nothing will happen to it, if I leave candy floss on the side in the laboratory for a while, it's probably going to change its physical form. And the same is true for amorphous materials formulated as medicines. They're not very stable. And so the pharmaceutical industry, it pays a lot of attention to stability because it wants products to remain the same across its shelf life. So to give you an example of this, I took some candy floss and left it in the laboratory on a uh, a heated plate at a constant temperature, and this is what happens. Time-lapse video, so it's um, speeded up a little bit, but I hope you can see that over time, and at a constant temperature, the um, candy floss seems to have disappeared. It hasn't actually disappeared, but it's got a lot, lot smaller than it was before. So uh, the question there is, what has happened? What has happened to the candy floss that has made it change its properties? Uh, and where does that fit into the diagram? That's really what we're trying to look at um, here today. 
So, first things first, I have a new colour, so we know we're talking about disappearance of an amorphous material. You can see from the video that my sample was held at a constant temperature of 25 degrees centigrade. So whatever has happened during this process, it can't involve moving left or right on this diagram because this axis is temperature and we know we were holding the sample to constant temperature. So let's say for argument's sake, this is where we were holding the candy floss, 25 degrees C. Remember, whenever we deliberately hold a material at a constant temperature, we say we are annealing. So we are annealing the material by holding it at a constant um, temperature, in this case, 25 degrees centigrade. Now, the question is, what has happened to our amorphous material while it's been sat at 25 degrees centigrade? To start to answer that, I need you to think about where the molecules are in the amorphous material. Remember, when we formed our amorphous material, we started as a liquid, a true thermodynamic liquid, with all the molecules randomly moving around, and we cooled the material down, and we cooled it down so fast it didn't have time to crystallize. And we created a supercooled liquid. Supercooled liquid meaning the system has the structure of a liquid, all the molecules randomly dispersed, but it's at a temperature below the melting point of one of its crystalline forms, so it's an unstable um, system. And I said, in this region, the supercooled liquid is kind of fluid. It's like a low viscosity liquid. But as we keep cooling down in temperature, the molecules are losing energy and they're occupying an ever decreasing volume. And that has the effect of raising the viscosity. So I said, as we go down in temperature, the viscosity gets higher and higher and higher until we get to this critical point, the glass transition temperature, where the viscosity becomes so high, to us, the material feels like a solid. So when we have an amorphous material that feels like a solid, we call it a glass. So at this point, we have formed a glass. Therefore, candy floss is a glass. That means the molecules are randomly ordered, but the viscosity is quite high. Because the molecules are randomly ordered, the volume or energy of our glass is quite high relative to our crystalline material. Now think what happens to our molecules on storage. Even though it's a high viscosity glass, it doesn't mean that the molecules can't move. Viscosity is tricky. Think about what happens when we touch a material. We touch it and it either flows away from us or the whole thing moves because it's a high viscosity material. But we're making a judgment on that on a matter of seconds. I left the candy floss in the laboratory for quite a few minutes. And in that time, the molecules are actually able to move. They're just moving very, very slowly. So, if when we've made our amorphous material, all the molecules are as randomly structured as we can make them, that is, not even two molecules are in any sort of structural alignment, no matter how difficult that is to um, imagine, we will have the highest energy or volume of our glass that we can. Because the molecules are able to move slowly as a function of time, then they will. And so we might start with some molecules very randomly distributed, and over time those molecules will start to move. Moving, they can either become closer together or further apart. I hope you can see that if they became further apart or more disordered, their uh, volume or energy would actually increase. And in nature, no process occurs spontaneously that increases the energy in particular of a system. So if molecules are going to move in our glass, they will always move in such a way as they become closer together, because as they become closer together, the system loses energy and volume, and that's thermodynamically okay. So the way I like to think about it is, when you make a glass fresh, the molecules are about as randomly distributed as they can be, and that glass will have the highest energy or volume that it can. On storage, the molecules are going to move, slowly, but the molecules are going to move, 
and they will never move such that the system becomes even more disordered. Therefore, they can only move in the direction of becoming more ordered and the system is going to lose energy and volume. Okay. That process of molecules moving and the system losing energy or volume is called relaxation, which is what this video is about. So that's what the process of relaxation involves. It involves the movement of molecules in a glass and they will always move in such a way as the system loses energy or volume. So if they're losing energy or volume, what does that mean for our diagram? Well, it's at 25 degrees. This is where our glass was when we started storing it. And as we leave it with time, it's losing energy or volume. So it's going to start to go down here, isn't it? So if we leave our uh, glass for a period of time and come back and look at it, we will see that the molecules are more aligned than they were at the start, or the system has a total energy, excess energy less than it did at the start, because we are moving down this line. I think you might imagine the relaxation is kind of important because the physical properties of our material are going to change the material relaxes. That's very important. And I'm going to come back to that in another video. But for now, don't worry about it. Just remember that relaxation is the process. Relaxation is the process by which the molecules move in a glass on storage and the system loses energy or volume. Another word that people use for relaxation is aging. Age. I never know if that's got an eye on it, so I'm going to go with that. Aging. Oh, yeah. Aging. So sometimes you see people say it's an aged glass. What they really mean is it's a relaxed glass. <laughs> relaxed does not mean it's sat by the pool having a cocktail, by the way. It means the molecules are becoming more ordered over time. So, one more thing you might ask me before we um, end this video, and this will be a good question, I've got to say. Uh, you might say, Simon, if the material relaxes a lot, so this arrow gets longer, is there going to become a point where the arrow is going to touch this dotted line? The dotted line being where our supercooled liquid would have gone if we hadn't gone through the glass transition temperature. And I would say, wow, <laughs> of all the questions you could have asked me, that was a really good one especially for this video about relaxation. So that's an excellent question. And the answer is absolutely. That can in principle happen. So what would happen is we leave our material for a decent length of time. It's losing energy or volume. And at some point, the material will get to this point of intersection where it becomes the super cold liquid that it would have been if, it, if we'd carried on down this line. What will happen at this point? Uh, it's kind of a theoretical argument because nobody really knows. But the way I like to think of it is this was a low viscosity super cooled liquid. So if we carry on down this line, in principle, it, re it remains a low viscosity liquid. And so I like to think of this point as being um, another transition point where the molecules in our glass go from being moving very slowly to moving a lot faster. And because they can move a lot faster and they want to crystallize, once you get to this point, we should pretty rapidly drop down to the crystalline state and the molecules will recrystallize. Now, at least in the pharmaceutical world, you might have heard of this sort of rule of thumb that people talk about where they say, oh, if you're gonna make an amorphous material, it should always be stored at least 50 degrees centigrade below its glass transition temperature. Why is that? <laughs> well, if you haven't heard of it, there's a rule of thumb that says an amorphous material should always be stored 50 degrees centigrade below its glass transition temperature. Uh, the answer is that is just a number randomly picked out of um, thin air, but I hope you can see that. If we have a material with a glass transition temperature here, and we were to anneal it at a temperature very close to its glass position temperature, then as it loses energy upon annealing, it doesn't have to lose an awful lot before it would touch this line. And once it's got to this point, the, the propensity for it to crystallize is going to be a lot higher. So in principle, this bit is quite slow, but this bit is quite fast. And so if we stored our glass very close to its glass transition temperature, the relaxation has only got to go for a little bit 
before it suddenly is able to crystallize. And that's why amorphous materials stored close to the glass transition temperature are quite unstable and tend to recrystallize. And I hope you can see that the further down in temperature we go, the bigger the gap is becoming between the glass line and the supercooled liquid line. So the bigger this gap is becoming, the longer it takes for the glass to go across that um, gap before the material can crystallize. So therefore, the colder we can make our annealing temperature, the more stable the glass is going to be. But the 50 degree thing, I think everybody is pretty much in agreement, it's just a, it doesn't really mean anything. You need to make an amorphous material, hold it at a particular temperature and see whether it crystallizes um, or not. But anyway, that's where that comes from. Right, that's the process of relaxation. In, in principle, what it means is you can make an amorphous material, no problem, but when you leave it, at any temperature, it doesn't, it doesn't matter which temperature, if you leave it, its properties are going to change. So you come back and measure it a day later, a week later, a month later, it's a completely different material. And that's very difficult. It has all sorts of impacts in different types of medicines, particularly dry powder inhalers, as we might talk about. Um, at some point in the future. But nonetheless, the principle is the molecule is always moving and that moving is towards a lower volume and lower um, excess energy and the process is called relaxation. If the material relaxes so much that the properties of the material get to the supercooled liquid line, the chances of it crystallizing are very high, which is the reason why we want to hold an amorphous material as far away from a glass transition temperature as we can. Now, I like differential scanning calorimetry. <laughs> not sure anyone else does. I do, I've spent my life using the, uh, DSC. There's a whole series of videos on um, DSC, by the way. Uh, and relaxing is quite interesting because an amorphous material that's relaxed shows a very interesting type of behavior in a DSC that a fresh amorphous material does not. And we can explain where that comes from with this diagram. And I'm going to do that in a separate video because I know you're on the point of falling asleep right now, aren't you? Yes. So in the next video, we will look at what happens to a relaxed glass when we heat it up in a DSC, again with reference to this diagram. But for now, that is all we need to know. Relaxing means the molecules in our glass are moving as a function of time. And that's quite dramatic. Right. Hope you found that useful. If you did, please hit the like button and consider subscribing because that really helps um, the channel. There's been loads of comments recently about how people are finding the videos and that's super nice to read. So thank you for that. A number of you have suggested topics for videos, which I should do my best to, um, to do for you. Um, if you're starting a new term at university and you think, oh, some interesting stuff on this channel, please tell your friends about it and see if the channel can help them uh, too. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you again soon.